We've been considering together Paul's second men. Now, second men does not mean they are second place in that they're unimportant. In fact, one of the purposes of this series of lessons has to try to emphasize just how important behind the scenes people are. And if you really looked with your eyes in the book of Acts and were able to count the number of people that were involved in the ministries of Paul, you might be surprised. Whereas Paul's the main character, he's the main principal missionary, there are many others who worked, who came in and out of the ministry from time to time, supporting, encouraging, finishing, taking care of details. As Paul, the more visionary guy, moved from town to town, did his preaching, he kind of left a lot of work for those others who made sure that the gospel was followed up on, that the second part of the Great Commission was completed, that they are taught to obey. So these important out-of-spotlight workers played vital roles in the success of Paul's evangelistic ministries. And one of the purposes in presenting these lessons to this congregation, to us, is they've been designed to inspire second men among us. For you to find a second man place, if the spotlight is not your thing, find a second man place in order to be involved in the works of the church. There's something for everyone. In fact, not only is there something for everyone, everyone is important. Every part of the body of Christ is valuable. So find your place and embrace this important calling that you have as a, as a, a support person, if you will, a behind-the-scenes worker, a second man. Now, this morning, we're going to consider one pretty well-known, Timothy. Timothy as a second man. Now, we would be hard-pressed to find a more beautiful Bible relationship than between Paul and Timothy. Really, Timothy becomes more than a second man, although he does fill that role. He becomes really close to Paul, and Paul considers him a son. And in the writings of Paul about Timothy, he refers to him as his son, his son in the faith, if you will, emphasizing this closeness of the relationship. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Paul writes to Timothy and says, To Timothy... My dear son, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. So there was such a closeness that when they separated or when something happened, there were tears on the part of Timothy. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. These are, are powerful words. Longing, tears constantly remembering you in prayer. This shows the, the closeness of the relationship. One of the important reasons I wanted to bring up Timothy and to discuss him as a second man today is because Timothy shows us that all people, even young people, can be second men. Timothy was probably a teenage young man when he first joined Paul on the second missionary journey, probably a teenager. But even as a teenage young man, he was serious about his faith. He was sincere. He was willing to learn. And he has a wholehearted commitment. In fact, Timothy tends to hang in there with the ministries of Paul more than anyone else. Barnabas was kind of a one missionary journey guy. Silas, kind of a one missionary journey guy. But Timothy joins on the second missionary journey and all the third missionary journey. He hangs in there. He's tough. He loves Paul and he loves the Lord, even as a young man. Now we'll emphasize these things throughout the lesson. We're going to consider Timothy under these four headings. He had a living faith. I almost chose the words sincere faith. He had a youthful maturity. He was close in his relationship with Paul and he was dedicated to the work of God. Let's consider first his living faith. When we are introduced to Timothy, it's in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey. 
probably converted on the first missionary journey while Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra, Timothy joined Paul and Silas on the latter half of the second missionary journey. If you look at this map we have, we, you can see the second missionary journey. And as you watch, you can see when they came there to Lystra, it is here in Lystra where Timothy lives with his parents, that Paul met him and he joined him for the remainder of the, the second journey. If you're turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, we'll be introduced to Timothy there. Acts chapter 16. I'll be using the New International Version. And I'm going to continue to use this as long as I can continue to uh, see it. I've had this one since I was 18 and it's smaller and smaller writing all the time. Acts 16. He came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jew and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. We had that in last week's lesson from Acts 15. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. One of the first things we notice then about Timothy is that he comes from what would be labeled in our modern terminology as a multicultural family. Now you think about it, his, his mother was a Jew and a devout Jew because she taught Timothy the scriptures. And then we have the father who was probably not a Christian, although the Bible isn't clear on it, but probably since they, uh, the Bible emphasizes that his mother was a believer, that we can assume that perhaps the father was not a believer, but we don't know for sure. And he was Greek, and he was a Gentile. So you have a, a Jewish Christian mother and a Greek or Gentile uh, father. And that is the family in which Timothy grew up. Despite this, Timothy developed a faith that lived in him, the Bible tells us. One planted there by a faithful mother and grandmother. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, the Bible says, I've been reminded, Paul's writing this, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I want to do a little aside for a moment. Do not underestimate the gift you give your children by raising them in the church. It is a precious gift. And sometimes I think for those of us who were raised by godly parents and who grew up in, in the church, um, we lose sight of just what a gift our parents gave us. I, I don't think I would have been a preacher had I not been raised my whole life in, in the church. It, it provided a foundation, a foundation of knowledge, a foundation of commitment. Uh, I was in Bible classes and worked in the Joy Bus ministry my whole life. When I was nine years old, I was a, a runner on the Joy Bus. If you lived in the Joy Bus days, you know what a runner was. It's the, the kid who ran from the bus to the door to help the children get on the bus. I'm sure I was a big help at nine years old, helping those kids get on the bus. But it was, it was a second man role, you see. It was a, a helper role. I wasn't a teacher. I wasn't the bus captain. Obviously didn't drive the bus. But I was a second man. I was a helper. And in doing that, it engaged me in the works of God. And here is a grandmother and a mother who saw to it, despite the religious division in the home that they had, despite this multiculturalism that was in the home, despite all of that, here was a, a mother and a grandmother who wanted to make sure this young man knew about Jesus. And they were successful at it. 
So don't underestimate the, the precious gift of raising children in the Lord is to them. And I encourage you in that role. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother. Now, these are powerful words. Sincere. That's not haphazard. It's not casual. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's from the heart. And it didn't come just by accident. It came by a living grandmother's faith and a living mother's faith who planted that life of God and Christ into this child who as a teenager was faithful, who as a teenager wanted to do mission work, who as a teenager was dedicated and sincere and devout and played a very important role as a second man. Notice these words from version comparisons. The NIV says that his faith was sincere. The New King James Version uses the word genuine. What a great word. And then it has in the footnote, the footnote, unhypocritical. This was a guy who really believed in what he believed in. Was thoroughly convinced, honest, natural, and sincere, and unfeigned. The literal translation says, here was a man, a young man, teenage young man, who was devout and serious about his faith. In 2 Timothy 3.15, describing his upbringing, Paul writes, From infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Who taught him from infancy? The scriptures, who did that? His mother and his grandmother in a multicultural home with a Greek Gentile father. Gotta love them. And Timothy didn't let the fact that he had a multicultural, religiously diverse family keep him from developing this sincere faith in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, For this I have sent you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Now I want you to see something. What did Timothy see in Paul? Genuineness. Sincerity. He didn't uh, see a Paul who preached one thing, but his life was different. He didn't see a Paul who preached to others to be faithful, but himself had all these things that were unfaithful. He saw in Paul the very thing he saw in his mother and his grandmother, which he developed in himself, which was sincerity, authenticity, genuineness. May we follow Timothy's example and pursue a living and authentic faith. May we say, my faith will be alive, it will be real, it will be authentic. Number two, we are amazed by Timothy as a second man in his youthful maturity. Now we've emphasized this a little bit, but it's as if Timothy is making the statement, I'll be faithful while I'm young. Some have suggested Timothy was an older teenager when joining the ministry team of Paul and Barnabas. Paul comments on Timothy's youthfulness in 1 Timothy 4.12, which we are familiar with, and here it is for you, for you to see. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Yes, Timothy, you're young, but even as a young person, you can set an example. Even as a young person, don't be intimidated by your youthfulness, but use the vigor and youthfulness that you have to do great, energetic, and wonderful things for God. Set an example in the way you talk, in your life, in the way you love, 
in your faith and in your purity. You set an example as a young person. In Acts 16, which we read earlier, the Bible tells us that among the Christians there in his hometown, his own church, those people spoke well of him. He had a good reputation among them, even as a young person, as a teenage young man who had grown up in that congregation, or at least had been there since its establishment. And he was one who was there, and, and they, they, they loved him. They spoke well of him. I think that sometimes we make a mistake of telling our teens about the good that they will do when they are adults in the kingdom of God. Paul, witnessing Timothy's sincerity and youthful vigor, allowed Timothy to exercise his gifts now, then, as a young person. And so I encourage our young people today. You are an important person now, and Timothy is an example for you to follow in stepping up and using your gifts for God even today. May our young people be encouraged by Timothy's example and pursue a sincere faith utilizing their gifts. I just thought of something right now, so I'm going to read it. There's a beautiful um, scripture at the end of Ecclesiastes about youthfulness. Is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark. This passage refers to youthfulness as a time to be vigorous and energetic and to remember God during those days before life passes you by, before it's gone, before it's over, or before there's a dimming of your eyes or there's dimming of your hearing or there's dimming of your physical posture. Before all these things happen, serve God now while you're young, while you have the energy and the youth to do so. Number three, Timothy had a closeness to Paul as if he was saying, I'm going to be willing to learn. Yes, I, I have an upbringing that helps me, but I'm a learner. I'm, I, I'm an apprentice. I, I want to be mentored. I have a lot to learn. And Paul is willing to take him under his wing and to teach him and to train him. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And as I pointed out earlier, these words, tears and long, underline the closeness of the relationship that they had together. Even as a young man, Timothy was open to being tutored and mentored by Paul, a man he respected and loved. He was willing to learn, and Paul was eager to teach Timothy. So young people, yes, use your energy, but be humble, be willing to learn. There are many wise people who have a lot of experience and I want to in encourage you to take a young person under your wing, love them, train them, teach them, assist the parents in doing so, see the potential in them, and help them. In that way, you'll be a blessing to them as Paul was to Timothy. And so here's some of the advice that was given by Paul to Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. And what you have heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Or this one from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Or this from chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we find many examples here. And you can read First and Second Timothy. They're beautiful books that show the, the mentoring of, of Timothy's faith by Paul. Paul also taught Timothy to mentor others. To sort of pass it along, if you will. To be willing to do what he is doing to him, to other people. And in that way... Faith is encouraged and passed on. 
in 2 Timothy 2, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. It's this mentoring process, if you will. You take someone, pick someone. You older, more mature Christians, choose someone. Choose a child, and you be that child's encourager. Just pick one. Any parent would love for you to do so. Just choose one. Say, that one is going to be my special son or daughter that I'm going to love on. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to uplift. I'm going to build up. May our young people be willing to be mentored and to learn, and may we as older adults take young people under our wings and train them. And young person, be willing to learn. It'll be a blessing to you. Number four, a dedicated worker. Now, this is what really inspires us about Timothy. This, this young man was, he was dedicated. It's almost as if he said, I'll do anything for Jesus. Whatever I am asked to do, I, I will do. After experiencing the rigors of the second missionary journey, Timothy participates in the third missionary journey as well. This illustrates his commitment to Jesus and to Paul. Here are some of the details of the third missionary journey. Remember, he's, he's participated in two-thirds of the, the, the one previous. It lasted for four years. Four years. Now, we get all excited about four days in Honduras. Four days. It's four years. That's quite a commitment. He wasn't quite so young when it was over. If you started when he was 16 or 17, he's growing up. He's growing up in the mission field, following Paul and these others. 2,515 miles. It's not by train or bus or plane. It's by walking or by sailboat. It's a long, rigorous journey. 1,190 miles by sea and 1,325 on land. A long way. A lot of work. A lot of learning. A lot of growing. A lot, of second man, a lot of second man work. A lot of people converted. A lot of joy in seeing people be baptized and churches established. Yes, there was persecution. There was being ridiculed and driven out of town and thrown into jail. But God being glorified. Christ being taught. The church being established. Look at this map, and you can see all the distance that they went on this trip. It's a long way. Covering a lot of ground. And while on this trip, Timothy witnessed Eutychus being raised from the dead after falling asleep during Paul's sermon and falling to his death out of an upper window. So wake up out there. We don't want any deaths today. No window to fall out of. And I, I like the way it's described by Luke in Acts chapter 20. Seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. <laughs> and when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Sitting in the window, listening to Paul go on and on and on. He fell fast asleep and fell out of the window. And Paul raised him from the dead. And Timothy was there and he witnessed that. Imagine the impact that would have had upon him. As Timothy matured, he wasn't always a young man. He grew up, and as he grew up, and he grew up on the mission field, and in his second man role, when we get to Romans chapter 16, Paul regarded him not as a young man, but as a fellow worker. He's grown up. He's an important part of their ministry team now. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends greetings to you. And as the number of Christians and, and churches increased, the need for second men increased too. Acts 20 gives us an impressive list of individual supporters and finishers. Look at all these people. He was accompanied by, by Sopater, the son of uh, per Pergus from Berea, Aristarchus, and I don't know all these people's names, but there they are, a bunch of them. And all, all these people were a part of, of the ministry. 
coming in and out, uh, delivering messages, second men. I ought to at least give them the dignity of learning how to pronounce their names, shouldn't I? And in Acts chapter 20 also, Luke is, is putting forth these names. and So he says, we, and with the, in the we passages, we know he was there as well. So there's a, quite a grouping of second men following along, helping, finishing, assisting, encouraging, taking care of details. There is evidence to suggest that Timothy was with Paul when he wrote 2 Corinthians. He was with him when he wrote Philippians. Was with him when he wrote Colossians. Was with him when he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. And Philemon. Timothy's there. He's present. He's a part. He's dedicated. He's committed. Timothy's dedication to the cause of Christ is further highlighted by his willingness to undergo circumcision in Acts chapter 16. Although not required for the Christian, Timothy submitted to circumcision to remove any impediments to the gospel. Now on another occasion, Paul resists a follower from being circumcised. But in this case, because Timothy was a Greek, he was not circumcised. But he submits to it because he doesn't want anything to get in the way of the gospel message. What a sacrifice of his own body. And surely Timothy was following Paul's example that he expressed in 1 Corinthians when he said, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible to those under the law. I became like one under the law so that I might win those who are, under the, who are in the law. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. You see, there wasn't anything that Timothy wasn't willing to do following Paul's example for the sake of the gospel. That's the most important thing. I had never noticed this in the Bible before. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, 23, suggests Timothy was susceptible to frequent illnesses. Now, I know that he took a little wine for stomach's sake in, that, in the same scripture, but there it says that because of your frequent illnesses, I hadn't, didn't know that, considered that he was a guy that got sick I guess while he was in the mission field maybe he drank the bad water along the way something but he was he was susceptible to this but even that didn't keep him from continuing in his work nothing would hinder him from serving wow what a second man I want him Timothy's vigor and dedication he kept up with Paul's untiring pace on two journeys is inspiring. And may we devote such energy to the works of God. May we say, I'll do anything for Jesus. Now I would like to close this lesson with Paul's charge to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you want to read along, you're welcome to. I don't have these out on a slide. I'm just going to read it. Listen to this beautiful charge that Paul gives to his son in the faith, his young second man. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time. God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. May we be inspired by Timothy, this great young second man, and find our place to work with such sincerity in the kingdom of God. If you'd like to respond this morning, please come as we stand and sing.